As you survey the landscape of Christians who are involved in the filmmaking world, yeah. is there anybody out there doing something that you like? You know, I, I don't want to pigeonhole guys. I just, I feel like there's a, there's an instinct to make everything monolithic. Like, this is Christian filmmaking. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of Christians out there making a lot of things. And I think as, as a Christian creator, I think all of them should be striving to do it before God as well as they possibly can. You know, just pursue excellence. So any kind of Christian storytelling, what should I be doing? Pursue excellence. Like make your craft as good as you can possibly make it. Make your art as good as you can possibly make it because that honors God. Glorify God with your craft. I don't want to get on my high horse about somebody who's been given you know, the, the widow's might. Somebody has their grandma's camera and 10 bucks and they go make the best thing they can make. Like, well, you know, just okay. But I want to be gracious to that. If God gave them that, like what do they, what do, they do with what resources they've been given? So then if somebody has $100 million and the studios will let them do whatever they want, I'm going to hold them to a much higher standard. And I think it's actually usually inverted, where Christian critics and consumers tend to give the big studio films a lot more grace than they give the little indie Christian projects. The little indie Christian projects are the ones where they have no resources and no assets and no experience, and they're just diving in because they think it's valuable and doing their best. And we could all think they could do a little better, or I hope they do better, or I hope this, their craft improves and, and they grow. But we tend to like, strangle them and then allow you know, a major studio to trot out garbage and we you know, extend all sorts of grace to it. I'd love to see that inverted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or we could say, yeah, the, the cinematography of this one does not hold up to the cinematography of this one, this big studio film. They paid one of the best cinematographers in the world millions of dollars to make sure every frame was amazing. So yeah, every frame's amazing. But the story over here and what it, over, what it achieves in the, in the end with the resources God gave them is something that he might bless more. Like which one makes him happier? And I think that's the only ultimate objective criticism is which one makes God happier? Which one, to which one does God say, well done, good and faithful servant? And to which one right. does he say, you know, depart from me. Right. So, and it's not as simple as cinematography. It's a, right. more, it's a more complex right. judgment there. So, there's a lot of guys out there, and that's, that's not to name anybody like specifically. I know a lot of guys involved in productions in a lot of different capacities. And some of them I think are like, eh, you know, you should step it up, friend. And some of them I think are working really hard. And some of them are making great big movies. And nobody thinks of them as a Christian filmmaker. But they are, you know, they're just, but they're not operating in the faith space as defined by studios and so they don't get tagged. But I think if all of them are pursuing excellence and I'm happy with them. Some of my favorite films, you know, I, I love Slumdog Millionaire because I, th I think that's one of the best Christian films ever. And it's not a Christian film. You know, I, th I think it's a beautiful, beautiful story about selflessness and, and blessing and grace and and it's not in the faith space, you know, mm -hmm. by, by any means, but I think it speaks to that space more effectively than most of the films that do target that space explicitly. So I love Slumdog. There's a little indie film called Sweetland, which I admire a great deal. I like it a lot. Um, and a number, I could name other, mm -hmm. you know, movies mm -hmm. that I enjoy, but. So as far as Christian filmmakers, there's more friends than, than guys, and I'm like, yes, anything he makes. Mm -hmm. Well, it, your, your comment raises two more questions in my mind. One is, um, and both related to the concept of excellence, does excellence in and of itself point to God is a question. Yeah. There have been some authors over the years who have said, just do that. Just go and be excellent at whatever it is you do, and that's your yeah. witness um, to God. And the other question is, well, what makes a film excellent? Yeah. I would say yes to the first one. Excellence. But of any kind, honors God. You know, that's, that's it. But, but that only is true if you define excellence correctly. So you move to the second question. And this is where I turn in a tight little circle. Excellence, ultimately, on the one hand, ha cannot be defined apart from God. So if he says something is excellent, can I have a category that says that, no, it's not? You know, like what he finds excellent. 
what he finds beautiful is the more beautiful thing. And so if you think about some you know, amazing building, brilliant architecture, just perfect, and gorgeous arrangement, and the pews are all perfect, and the organist just played Bach like Bach couldn't even play it. And the pastor gets up and denies the resurrection. It's like, how, how beautiful is this? How beautiful is the moment? And then you have a little like square white, <coughs> excuse me, a little square white gospel church kind of falling down and an old pastor banging on an out-of-tune piano, singing an old gospel song in a place that's full of true worship and glorification of God, which is the more beautiful scene. One's out of tune, out of plumb, out of square, out of key. <laughs> you know, it's like everything's, right. everything's off. And yet I think that the scene is a more beautiful thing, is a more excellent thing than the other one. So you can have a really well, a very well whitewashed tomb. And you can have a very shoddy looking, uh, you know, beautiful inside, you know, place. A place with this kind of like awful exterior, but everybody's like, oh, you have to eat there. Like nobody can do ribs like Billy. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's complex. Mm -hmm. And I would say that at the same time, that doesn't get Christians and it doesn't get them off the hook for trying to tune the piano. You know, it's like build the square building, tune the piano. Pursue excellence in your craft, just mechanically in the craft. But you also have to pursue excellence of heart, excellence of soul, excellence of perception. So somebody could brilliantly and beautifully tell lies in a film. And it took all sorts of ingenuity and incredible camera work and mastery of the art form to tell the lie. And somebody else could speak more in a more clumsy way, not nearly as refined in the craft, but have a clean, beating heart at the center of the scene that's really telling the truth. And I, I think that's the more excellent thing. And the, it's the more excellent thing. Ideally, you merge the two. Right. Ideally, you have the temple, you know, right. where the craftsmanship is, surpasses all things, and at the very heart, you have the Holy of Holies and true worship. So I mean, that's the ideal situation. Right. But that's not always how it cuts. I mean, the two, some people say form and content, you know, the whole form over content right. discussion. You know, I think content can ruin the form, and I think form can ruin the content. Mm -hmm. If you say you have the beautiful truth, the gospel is the most beautiful truth of all time, but you express it in an ugly way, I think you're lying. I think you're a hypocrite. You know, I think you're failing your message with your lack of artistry. So become more excellent in your craft. You know, it's like form can can undermine and destroy content. But if you're brilliant and excellent and your content is awful, then I think your content undermines form as well. I don't want to, get, I don't want to give either of them precedence over the other. I want to balance them both and then average the scores. So that, in a way, then what you're saying would give the indie Christian filmmakers hope in the sense that they, at least they have the message right. Even if their method of storytelling sure. or their yeah, form you know, isn't as polished well, two, or as good. Well, two things. Like one is, don't suck. Like just don't. <laughs> you know, and a lot of it's hand. I'd ask you to define that, but I'm afraid yeah. to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when the indie Christian filmmakers set out, here's the here's the bad news. When the indie Christian filmmakers set out to to tell the good message, if you tell it badly, you're not telling the good message. It's like you've, your form has betrayed your content. Like your content is undermined by your form. Now that's on the one hand. On the other hand, if you're called to do this and you're supposed to do it and, and you're failing pure and simply because of resources, which is possible, mm -hmm. then do your best before God and give it to Him. It's like make the best movie you can make with the stuff He's given you and then give it to Him. Now the thing is, if you're successful, you better improve. The problem is that people end up successful and end up with a lot of money, and they punch the formula of shoddy Christian storytelling because it makes a lot of money. See, we're fine. We don't have to make it good. They're like that's that's the problem. When when somebody sets out with a tiny budget and they do their best and like oh you know good try, like noble effort. You're bold. You're brave. Go fight. Win. But then they're successful and they make a bunch of money and then they do the same thing over again. That's where it's like come on now. Like you know you you have resources now. Let's, let's see some excellence in craft. And I think that that's um, 
we should all be pursuing craft. God wants excellency of craft. He who is excellent in his work will stand before kings. It's like we want the, what we make with our hands to be beautiful because that's what honors God. But we want, if they're containers and vessels, we want these beautiful vessels to also hold truth, beautiful truth, not just be empty and not have sourness inside. So I want to give hope to those guys. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, say, be incredibly hard on yourself. Like, you want to be harder on yourself than anybody else. I mean, you want to take criticism, absorb it, and work harder than anyone. Your work ethic and an incredibly high standard to achieve the best crafted film that you can achieve, like, that's, that's where you got to be going. And then also comfortable with Chesterton's wisdom that anything worth doing is worth doing badly. You have to be bad at it before you can be good at it. You've got to be willing to be bad at it to get to the good part. So, Yeah. Well, one of the challenges, I think, uh, that filmmaking presents as opposed to perhaps novel writing or some yeah. other form of expressions is it's very expensive. Yes, it is. And so because of that, you have to involve backers, financial mm -hmm. people who have uh, other reasons for being yeah. connected to your project. And then if you want to get it to the point where it's actually going to recoup yeah. your investment, you have to have it distributed in a certain way yep. that involves even another group of yeah. People like Sony Pictures or whoever, you know, and so by that and time your advertising money it has to be recouped and yeah, uh, so prints for the screens. You've got so many other people who are involved in the project at varying levels with very diverse interests and motivations. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Unless you achieve the status of a Kurosawa someday, yeah. where you can dictate all those things yourself and you don't have to worry about people putting pressure on you, how do you maintain the purity of a project and of your vision for doing it? apart from those kinds of pressures? You know, it's, uh, I think it's saying no to some investments and saying no to some opportunities and making sure that the people you're working with are comfortable with your vision leading. Like they could be in for other reasons. I'd be happy to work with an investor where I have one motivation and his motivation is to get rich. Like, okay, and I'll, I'll give you the risks and the warnings, but then I'm gonna take your money. You'll risk it and I'm gonna go after my agenda. As long as I'm open and clear about it first, and then you pursue it actively, like this is the one we're going after. I think that it's it's like football. I mean, like it, being on set, like directing a feature film, even a small independent feature film, was like being in the craziest, roughest football game I've ever been in. <laughs> you know, just blindside hits and things going wrong, and you call one play, and then it just gets broken. You got to try again, and I love that. I love, I love that. So especially, I loved football. But then in contrast to my other art form, which is isolation hiking, getting out there and having the war and the melee of interests and the chaos of things potentially going wrong is something I feed on, something that energizes me. So difficulty, failures, things, things falling apart uh, is, I think, part of the joy of it. You know, it's like I also, the only jobs I've had in my life full-time are construction, you know, a team attacking a house, building a house, and writing. So I couldn't get a job out of graduate school to teach full-time. I could get little part-time things. And, you know, everybody told me, well, if you want to be a writer, don't quit your day job. But it turns out to be a lot more helpful when you don't have a day job. <laughs> so I just wrote and wrote and wrote, and that ended up becoming my full-time profession. And it became my full-time profession before I achieved any other full-time profession. So my experiences were construction, going through college, working, you know, building houses, and then as a student, and then as a writer. And the, the writer is this really, you know, solo work. And I love the team community aspect of the, of the sport of filmmaking. You know, mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And when you find somebody good, uh, you want to hang on to them. Like, oh, wow, like this guy, this guy's really good at this job. He's going to be on my team in every film from now on. You know, this one is just, you start collecting people. And I think that's why you see filmmakers working with the same teams over and over and over again, because they know this guy has my back on this, and this guy has my back on that, and this girl, man, she can, I know I don't have to worry about that at all. And it starts to take care of itself in some way, but it's always gonna be chaos. It's always gonna be exciting in that regard, but I loved it. So like the war of interests and the chaos of motivations and, and trying to run the gauntlet through and at the end have created something from all this melee is, it's like being on the job site again with my tool bags on and the concrete trucks show up and we realize we forgot to dig half the foundation. And it's like, grab a shovel, <laughs> and here we go. Um, and you attack it. So there's a lot of the same 
intensity, uh, and I didn't realize how much I'd missed it. Mm. You know, when when I got back into it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been demonstrated before that small independent film producers from Idaho can uh, <laughs> achieve success. It and can happen. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And uh, especially if we define success however we like. However you like. Yes. Success. I'll define. I'll define myself into success. <laughs> like, that's all I was aiming for. Let's yeah. Hit what I was aiming for. If you shoot the ground, well, that's what you were pointing the gun at, right? That's, that was the goal. Well, very good. Well, it's been just a pleasure talking to you about these things. Thank you. Nate, thank you for taking Thanks the time so to do this. And it's been great having you here uh, at Bethlehem College and Seminary for uh, sharing your insights and your exhortations with our students. And so we just. Thanks so uh, much for having blessed. me. It's been, so. it's been a great experience.